welcome to this Caldor Centre conference session called Courts at the Frontier. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we virtually meet and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Sangeeta Pillay and I'm a Senior Research Associate at the Caldor Centre and it is my absolute privilege to chair this conversation today where we will explore the current state of play of refugee litigation in Australia, the challenges that litigants face and whether making strategic choices about when and how to litigate can help improve protection outcomes for refugees seeking protection in Australia. Joining me today are four of Australia's best and brightest practitioners of strategic refugee litigation. Matthew Albert is a leading refugee law barrister who's been awarded the Victorian Bar's Susan Crennan Pro Bono Award and the International Commission of Jurists Victoria John Gibson Award for his advocacy on behalf of asylum seekers. Matthew's also a senior fellow at the University of Melbourne Law School, where he teaches refugee law as part of the postgraduate program. Scott Cosgriff is a senior lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre, where his work focuses on a combination of strategic litigation, policy solutions and advocacy to protect the rights of people seeking asylum. Scott currently leads a coalition of law firms and barristers that run high court cases to prevent the Australian government from sending um, women, children and men who have been transferred to Australia for medical treatment back to Nauru or Papua New Guinea. Prior to his time at the Human Rights Law Centre, Scott worked at UNHCR Canberra and at the Refugee Advice and Casework Service, which many of you will know as RACS. Arif Hussain is a senior solicitor at RACS. He leads the Judicial Review Program, which provides critical legal representation to people who have had their refugee claims refused by the restrictive fast track assessment and removal process. Arif has diverse experience as a refugee law solicitor and prior to his time as RACS, he worked at the Human Rights Law Centre where his work focused on securing urgent medical treatment for asylum seekers subject to offshore processing as well as protecting the rights of people transferred from offshore processing to Australia and the Kids Off Nauru campaign. And last but not least, San Marti Verma is an accredited specialist in immigration law currently based at Clothier Anderson Immigration Lawyers. She's been the instructing solicitor in leading cases concerning the integration of Australia's non-reformal obligations and the character powers under the Migration Act. Um, San Marie is the former chair of the Law Institute of Victoria's Refugee Law Reform Committee and is currently the deputy chair of the excellent visa cancellations working group. So we've got an hour for this panel discussion and about 40 minutes of this will be devoted to a discussion between the panelists which I'll chair, and after that, the panelists will have a chance to respond to some of your questions. You can submit these as the session progresses by clicking on the Q&A button, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. And you also have the capacity to vote for questions that other people have submitted that you'd like to see answered. There'll also be a breakout session directly after this session, focusing on what it means to be strategic in refugee litigation in Australia. Um, and in that you'll be able to take part in an interactive discussion that will be facilitated by Katie Robertson from the Peter McMullen Centre for Statelessness. Um, so I'd very much like to welcome you to join that after this session if that's something that interests you and there'll be a link in the in the chat to that. All right, without further ado, um, I'd like to kick off with a question to all of our panellists. Um, I'm interested in what each of you uh, see as the current state of refugee litigation in Australia. When do you feel like engaging in litigation is likely to be a good option for your clients? And Scott, perhaps we'll start with you because I know your role involves making active choices about whether to pursue litigation or whether another form of advocacy would be more appropriate or some combination of the two. Thanks, Angeda. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you to the Caldor Centre for the invitation to speak. Um, and well done on putting, a, putting on a wonderful conference um, throughout the week, um, really making the most of the opportunity to have international perspectives. Um, I think it helps to understand refugee law in Australia, firstly, as a type of public law. It's about the relationship between the government and individuals. And uh, first of all, there's a, a very simple role that legal action plays um, from a rule of law perspective. Um, can, uh, uh, is the things, is the, are the things that the government uh, 
does to people, uh, authorised by law or not. Um, and uh, legal action can allow people to exercise their rights, firstly, by resolving individual disputes. Um, secondly, by um, ensuring that the law is not overstepped and it's clarified in cases of ambiguity. I think in some ways, um, our work at the Human Rights Law Centre does not typify the role of um, refugee litigation in Australia um, because um, we uh, are, are focused on um, uh, looking at um, ways not just to uh, represent individuals who have particular grievances, um, but to also try to use litigation as a way to shift either policy or shift the law or um, to shift sentiment. Um, that's not always easy. It can be very powerful when it clicks. Um, we try to uh, marry legal action with advocacy. Um, but it's important to remember that when we're doing this, and this is something we can talk more about, that first and foremost, this is always a professional relationship between lawyer and client. It's governed by professional obligations and uh, anything else that can be achieved beyond that has to be secondary to it and accommodate it. Arif, perhaps we'll go to you next. Your current work with RAX's Judicial Review Program involves providing legal representation to people in the fast track cohort who have had their claims for protection refused. Now, many of you will be familiar with the fast track cohort, but for those of you who might not be, like that across the minutiae of Australian migration law, um, the fast track process subjects certain people seeking asylum to a more restrictive process with no permanent protection visa options and with more restrictive review rights when, um, when their claims for protection are denied at first instance. So Arif, what do you see as the role of refugee litigation in this context where review options and litigation options are quite narrowly framed? And when do you think that proceeding with a case is a, is a good call to make? I think, um, thanks, Sangeetha. Um, I think the, to understand the role of litigation in this area, we have to understand the issues faced by refugees and people seeking asylum in Australia. Um, at the moment, uh, refugees and people seeking asylum um, face significant barriers in understanding and exercising their legal rights because our legal system, legal processes and government institutions that don't take into account the cultural, linguistic and socioeconomic barriers faced by refugees in exercising their rights. Not only do our institutions and um, government policies don't take into account those barriers, but we've seen through the operation of sovereign borders that they deliberately try to make um, the situation here in Australia as difficult as possible for people. So, that others are deterred. So that's a, a fundamental pillar of the Operation Sovereign Borders policy. And in that context, we see, um, um, we see cuts to legal representation or funding to, to uh, legal representation, representation for refugees. We've seen, as you say, the introduction of a restrictive refugee determination process, and we see the introduction of temporary protection visa. So there's a a lot of need, not just because of the underlying um, uh, barriers that refugees face, but because of the uh, situation being exacerbated by government policy. So in that context, our work at RACS provides um, critical legal uh, representation through, um, through assistance from our pro bono partners and barristers to ensure that people who have gone through this restrictive process over eight years or sometimes over 10 years that um, they have that final um, day or the, the final safety and right and access to justice in terms of applications to judicial review at the federal court, at the federal circuit court. Thank you for that incredibly, I don't know, concise and pithy explanation of how law and policy really work hand in hand. And I know as a person that's been in this space for something like three years now, I still find it quite overwhelming to get across. And so I can't imagine what that would be like for somebody that is not a lawyer that is seeking protection, that's coming from trauma, that is coming without um, English as, as, their first, as their first language. It's, uh, thank you for the work that you, that you do also. 
Um, San Marie, I'll turn to you now. Your practice spans both refugee litigation as well as migration litigation, more broadly speaking. Do you see them as one as the, as the same thing as refugee litigation in, in, in your experience, a subset of broader migration litigation in Australia, or are there specific factors that you see as distinguishing refugee litigation from other migration litigation? Thanks, Agitha. That's a really interesting question. Um, when I got it over email this morning, um, I was preparing to answer a different question, but this is better. Um, look, to, to, to my mind, um, you know, since at least 2014, onwards. Um, refugee law as we know it in, in Australia is not refugee law as a matter of in, international law. It, it is um, a, a series of um, sort of requirements and obligations that are enshrined as a matter of domestic law that depart fundamentally from what international law um, describes it as being refugee, refugee protection, right? So practice of refugee law requires and, you know, Arif will tell you in much more interesting detail, um, an intimate knowledge of the technocratic ways that Australia goes about enshrining and delimiting its protection obligations um, in a way that's, um, you know, Australia's pioneered some real legal, you know, restrictive legal innovations that the rest of the world, you know, look, looks upon, you know, offshore processing as an example, um, you know, part 7AA of the Act, which, you know, creates um, and limits the function of the Immigration Assessment Authority. It's based on a UK example, but it's unique to the Australian context. You know, th this is, um, you know, fundamentally a matter of our, our domestic law. So practicing refugee law involves asking the same type of questions as one, as one does when you, you practice migration law. That is, you know, what are the frameworks of the, what is the framework of the powers that are seeking, or that the decision maker is seeking to exercise? Um, both as a matter of the Migration Act and as a matter of the migration regulations. You know, what are the extrinsic materials that inform that exercise? What was the purpose of the legislature in creating those powers? You know, with reference to that framework, you know, what is and isn't relevant to the exercise of powers and with all of that in mind, um, you know, to borrow the phrase of Justice Bromberg, you know, you know examining what in fact is really being done to people um, in that exercise of power. So I don't think that there's anything categorically different, um, you know, in the skill set um, or in the exercise that we're engaging in as public lawyers and uh, uh, as administrative lawyers. We're seeking to hold um, public officials to account for what, in fact, they do to individual people and, and cohorts of people. And I think, you know, and we'll come to discuss this a little bit later, but, um, you know, the response to COVID-19 has been you know, by way of the proliferation of these administrative categories and, and boundaries and instruments and rules and regulations. And this is like a, um, you know, playing field for the administrative law mind. You know, we, we shouldn't just accept that because there is this so-called, you know, exceptional public emergency, not, not to deny, of course it is, but um, that necessarily any legislative response is going to be proportionate or that anything that is done to people in that name is going to be proportional within power and, and so forth. So um, to, to my mind, it's, it's the same skill set because it's, what Australia is doing is um, rendering even more and more parochial and more and more domestic um, its refugee, and refugee protections that it's undertaken at international law. Thank you for that very for that very clear explanation and there's, there's plenty in that that I know we'll, co we'll come back to later in this um, in this discussion and dig into further. Um, Matthew finally coming to you as a, a barrister that runs a large number of refugee matters and, and somebody that comes into the process after um, solicitors have done the initial scoping about what cases they'd like to take forward. What do you see as the role of refugee litigation in Australia today and when in your view is it worth taking a case all the way to court? Um, thanks. Thanks for the question. But um, firstly, and more importantly, thanks for including me in this panel and this um, conference. Um, it, it, it's uh, honoured to be um, with the other people on the panel um, whose work I admire, I should say. Um, I think the, the question you ask um, to me, Sangeeta, is, is um, slightly amusing in that um, I'm a litigator, so the question of when's it a good option to litigate is... Um, the answer to that question is always, um, but if if we step back for a moment um, and ask ourselves what I think is a slightly more um, important and nuanced aspect to that question, and that is what with clear eyes are we trying to achieve 
by litigation. And I think in this sense, there are two factors that seem to me to be um, important and they pick up on some of the themes, particularly that Sam Marty was talking about, that um, are perhaps uh, maybe not unique to Australia, but uniquely important in Australia. So the first of the factors that I think has to weigh into the question of strategic litigation um, in the refugee sphere is uh, to be clear-eyed about the fact that litigation can be and often is good for the individual for whom you are acting, but it may or may not be good for the cause of refugees. Um, that is to say that one can often have a um, handy win in a refugee case, that is to say a win that has systemic benefits, and the result of that win is the individual gets a good outcome and the legislature, the parliament, <laughs> amends the law so that no one else gets the benefit of that win. And that's a brutal part of refugee litigation in this country in particular. But again, I think one has to be clear-eyed in engaging in strategic litigation because the most strategic litigation is the litigation that's most likely to lead to legislative reform. And so, in a sense, one is walking on a minefield and is not quite sure what's going to go off. If a case exposes a weak link, then it, that link often gets reinforced by legislative um, amendment. So that's the first factor. The second factor, and I think this fits, this, this is to place um, refugee litigation into a broader um, conversation of which all of the audience would be very um, familiar, and that is that um, litigation in its nature is, um, has got three um, core elements. It is public, it is individualised, and it's a form of accountability. Now, the reason that I emphasise those things is that in an Australian context, as everyone is uh, familiar, the way that refugee issues or the cause are grappled with tends to be high level, that is to say not individualised. It is at least depersonalised, but I think there's a pretty strong argument to say it's dehumanised and it operates at a political often fact-free um, level. And so litigation serves the important public role, I think, of both revealing individual stories and revealing the actual human context in which all of this happens. But I also think, and uh, I think it's actually a really important point of which I am acutely conscious regularly, I actually think litigation serves a really important um, role in writing history. If one looks at the extraordinary work that Arif and his um, team at HRLC did for the Medivac cases, there are, I think I'm right in saying, 50 reported decisions where the court has recorded for the first time individual stories of the extraordinary inhumanity of that um, Australian refugee policy. So litigation um, becomes the first draft of history. Thank you so much for that. And before we move on, I cannot resist the opportunity to slip in a very small plug um, for a, um, an initiative that the, a, a podcast and um, story series that the Caldor Centre is about to launch um, in partnership with, with RAX and um, with The Guardian um, and the Centre for Ideas at UNSW. It's called Temporary. And the object of this project is to tell the stories of, um, of refugees that form part of the fast track cohort that Arif's work um, focuses overwhelmingly on at the moment and tell the stories of these people as they take journeys through the Australian legal system. So the idea was to explain the Australian legal system but break that idea of looking at it as this very high level depersonalised thing where people are referred to by numbers rather than rather than names and the individual experience gets lost so um, the trailer's out now and I think someone will drop a link in the chat at some point but the um, the podcasts and the stories begin to launch next week on the 26th of November I believe and will roll out um, over the next month or so so please do check that out if um, if you're interested we're very excited about it um, 
end plug. <laughs> um, the, um, there's a question that we've just got through the chat that um, touches on something that I, um, I wanted to ask anyway. So the question is, I'm interested in the panel's thoughts about which areas they think are right for strategic litigation in Australia in the short, medium and long term. And um, we might come back to the, like, where we see litigation going at the end of this panel, but I, I wanted to ask everybody now what you see as um, the aspects of the Australian legal system that feature most commonly in Australian refugee litigation at, at the moment. Perhaps we'll start with, with you, Arif. Yeah, so I think um, at the moment, in terms of my work in the fast track process, um, I think um, a significant portion of the federal court uh, systems caseload is made up of um, decisions uh, or the migration caseload of the federal court system is made up of appeals of decisions made by the Immigration Assessment Authority, so the IAA. Um, I think as mentioned by Sanmati um, and Matthew, this is not surprising because um, the IIA um, is a body that was put in place as part of the fast track process that strips away a lot of the um, procedural fairness rules that are at the crux of our administrative processes, um, such as a right to a hearing at a review level. Um, and um, in, in this context where we have um, uh, right now, according to the department's own statistics, around 8,500 people um, refused by the IAA at and who are at judicial review or ministerial level, it's not surprising that this makes up a, lo a lot of our work and other um, uh, community legal centers work. Um, and to kind of underline the, you know, the, the barriers that I talked about and the need um, and um, the amount of work in this area and the difference between how the IAA approaches things and how other refugee determination processes that we had in the past, for example, the Refugee Review Tribunal, at the moment, based on statistics available from the IAA, um, from the top 10 source countries that end up re being referred to the IAA, 85% of those cases, um, in 85% of those cases, the IA agrees with the department to refuse um, uh, the visa that the person applied for, the protection visa that the person applied for. Um, so. That is not surprising because we talked about at the beginning that we've had legal funding stripped. So a lot of people will have to, um, uh, without any legal representation, without knowledge of the legal system and additional barriers of trauma um, uh, and uh, socioeconomic barriers, they will have to navigate this process. Um, so it's not entirely surprising for us uh, at RACS that we have such a large number and this, and this cohort makes um, a big part of our work. Thank you very much for that. And I think it, it makes in a lot of areas in, um, in Australian litigation, we've seen the way that legislation's drawn increasingly restricting the scope of what options are available and, um, and kind of creating the terrain that the litigators need to work with in a in a very in a very narrow in a very narrow way it's um in awe of the work that um that you that you do um San Mari, what um what do you see as the the aspects of the system that most commonly feature in the refugee cases that that you run yeah, sure. Um, and thank you to the participant for the, the question, um, you know, about indefinite detention and, and the form of harm. Um, sorry, that's my partner giving me a glass of water. Very helpful. <laughs> um, um, look, I, I think, uh, I don't know whether it's common, but I think what's increasingly going to feature in, in litigation in this space um, is um, agitation over the conditions in detention, right? And, and um, uh, an in increased interrogation of, of the purposes of detention and why precisely it is that people are being detained. Um, for what purpose, for how long and, and what for? Um, so uh, I might talk briefly at this stage about um, the litigation in the COVID-related context and how that's played out in, in Australia. And I think we'll come back later um, to talking about the international context for that litigation because it, it built on the back of, um, you know, a lot of developments in Australia, you know, um, 
arising from the medevac related litigation and plenty of S99 and the cases onwards, um, but also um, important developments in both the UK and, and the US. Um, so th there were two cases that, that challenged um, the conditions of detention in, in light of COVID. Um, so plaintiff M37 was um, the case that was brought by um, the Human Rights Law Centre and BNL20 was um, the case that was commenced by our firm. Um, both cases um, sought to argue that there was um, an, an apprehended tort um, or a, a breach of duty of care that um, would be likely in the future to crystallise into a tort um, or, or a wrong um, ag against particular applicants who were sort of in a position that was demonstrative of um, vulnerable people in immigration detention more generally, right? Um, so in our case, um, the plaintiff was a 68-year-old man with type 2 diabetes and a range of other health conditions. Um, he's by no means the oldest person in, in the immigration detention network, but um, he, he was one of the oldest who hadn't been released at that stage. Um, unusual about his case was that for um, sort of 10 years um, since he arrived in Australia and before his visa was cancelled late last year, he had been in the community um, with his Australian citizen son and his grandchildren. Um, until, you know, the boom was lowered and his visa was cancelled at the end of last year based on an adverse security assessment that in turn related to matters that were about 15 years old that took place um, in another country. So he's been detained since that time for a little bit over a year at this stage. So um, our argument was so we commenced litigation in, in April, I believe, um, was when things came together. And our, our basic argument was that there was um, a, at least a, a serious case to be argued that there was a um, breach of duty of care um, involved in the circumstances in which he was being held in um, immigration detention and um, he, he's being held uh, he was being held at that stage in Mitre in um, in Melbourne in just located in Broadmeadows and our argument or, or um, was not necessarily unique to him of course his vulnerabilities put him in a uniquely high risk cohort but our attack was squarely upon what it was that the Department of Home Affairs and its its lead contractor Serco um, were doing to safeguard people uh, against COVID-19. And our basic argument was that um, the measures that had been taken to protect um, detainees against the risk of COVID-19 entering detention centres um, and then infecting individual detainees. Um, oh, is that me? Is that me which we were ready? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Um, our basic argument was that the measures that were being taken um, involved a breach of duty of care. That is, they were not reasonably sufficient um, to prevent COVID-19 from entering the centres um, and once it entered, from spreading like wildfire. Um, and this was supported by that stage by litigation developments in the UK, the US, very bold um, litigation that was much broader than just an argument in, in tort. Um, the, that litigation was brought on the basis that there was... Um, a level in the UK context, in the US context, a level of medical indifference that involved um, a breach of constitutionally enshrined rights, you know, on, on behalf of hundreds of detainees who were held. Um, and then, um, you know, particular to our client, there was a um, you know, pro bono expert opinion that, that was offered um, that placed him at a 15% um, mortality risk. And so after these arguments, and of course the Commonwealth responded with um, evidence uh, from an expert that said, the risk to people in detention was um, lower than in the general community. So that this was the Commonwealth's position in, in response that um, immigration detention is a COVID free paradise where we should um, all wish to live. So um, ha having assessed the arguments um, on either side, um, Justice Murphy um, uh, delivered interim judgment in, in August, um, accepting that there was a serious question to be tried um, in relation to a breach of duty of care to our, our client and ordering that his detention at MITRE cease immediately. Um, so there was that. That's the good news. Um, you know, as Matthew said, what follows, um, you know, like day and night from successful litigation outcomes in this space is is a response. Um, so the result of that was that our client was not, um, as good sense would say, released into the community um, to be with his family again. Rather, he was transported to Western Australia, which commenced a second limb of the litigation, which involved a, a challenge um, to, uh, of course, we all understand, because we've been, some of us have been locked in Melbourne for a long time now, that um, one must seek permission to enter, enter other states. So permission was sought on behalf of our client. And this again is an administrative decision that was made. So we commenced a second limb of the litigation in the Supreme Court of Western Australia, seeking to challenge 
um, the basis on which that permission was sought and given um, by the relevant state authorities in Western Australia and arguing that procedural fairness obligations were owed um, to persons whose, as a matter of basic administrative law, persons whose interests are affected by an administrative decision. Um, I suppose all litigators who lose say this, but we thought there was a good argument there. We continue to think that there's a good argument there. Um, there. There are, these decisions affect interests. Um, people have a right to be heard. Um, we, we didn't get the order that we sought and as a result, our client was transferred. So he's now in um, sort of an individual sort of protected facility in, in Western Australia. Um, but as a result of that, it, it was recognized on a rather comprehensive and um, the judgment, so far as interim judgments go, it's, it's 40 pages long and it's, it's worth a read. And it sets out precisely what it is that the Commonwealth had done to that, to that stage um, to safeguard people in the immigration de detention network and it spells out how it's deficient. So this will be, you know, assuming that COVID's not going to be cured um, like um, the right wing will tell us by way of a, an, um, you know, injection in March next year, assuming that that's not going to be the case, um, these questions of protecting people's health in the immigration detention network, um, protecting against, in fact, the health-related consequences of the way the Commonwealth manages COVID by keeping people in solitary confinement away from visitors and so forth. These are going to be spaces of litigation into the future. I want to stay on that case just, just for a moment it, and thank you for telling that story. It's such a, it's such a fascinating example and it's very unfortunate that it ended up going the way that it did, but it it did. Um, I I know there was a lot of planning around potential litigation um, in the in the context of of COVID nineteen, particularly re relating to people that are in that were in detention, um, but not exclusively. And very little of that ended up ultimately in in court, but but your case did, and I I know how much thought and planning went into picking the right case, picking the right client in order to make a, 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 a case about something that could potentially affect a large number of people. And um, even though it didn't go your way in, in the end, I was, I was wondering if you could draw out perhaps what the, um, what the main kind of, I don't know, what, was, what were the things that made this a strategic thing to proceed with? For, for you, what were the factors that you felt you had to consider in order to run this litigation in a way that was going to be good in this context? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose, you know, ha having practiced in this area for a very, very long time, um, you know, almost a decade, um, you know, there are some interesting examples that I can recall of, um, you know, clients suddenly being subject to a litigation outcome in another case where I really wish that person had picked up the phone <laughs> and talked to me uh, about the decision to run that case before my client suddenly um, became caught by it. But um, the decision to bring the case was collaborative in um, the broader sense of that term. Not only was it collaborative in terms um, that, you know, we had all of these quite, and I think, Sagita, you were on some of them, these kind of um, agonizing, you know, na national phone linkups about, um, you know, with litigators all across the country uh, about, you know, cases, how far advanced certain cases were, what the pitfalls were of bringing certain cases. So there were, you know, there was legal collaboration here in Australia. Um, actually critical to running the case was a piece of evidence that um, we acquired from the legal team in, in the UK. You know, they, they had a masterful report pr prepared by, um, you know, a professor, Coco, or Croco, I've, I've forgotten what his name is, but these resources were made publicly available, you know, and the ACLU's website in, you know, the States made available all of the pleadings um, that they'd advanced in just instantaneously, you know, as a matter of public interest. And I was in touch with those litigators, especially in the UK, um, and their action was unsuccessful, but it resulted, it had a much more fruitful result than what we've seen here in Australia. It, um, the, the bringing of the litigation reduced the detention population by almost half. Um, and, and so that's another sphere of legal collaboration, but you know, yet another important sphere was um, you know, creating connections with people who were like, let, let's all be clear, we, we bring litigation because our clients urge us to litigate, like our clients are you know, in, engaged in a struggle that we just kind of you know, are in temporary service of. And so this litigation was brought because my client was agitating his condition, his people in his position, he has a you know, network of you know, similar aged people um, and, you know, people who are in a similar position to him, folks get together in cohorts in detention. They were agitating his condition. Um, there were people who were supporting them. So it, it involved 
um, you know, talking to people in detention networks, it involved actual um, evidence about the conditions in detention that was secured not just from our client, but from other people who were in the detention network. Um, insights about how um, detention or COVID risks were being managed was um, sought from people who would visit detention centres and who had links with folks in detention. So it, it was, um, it was a very sustained and careful and probably I would say month long discussion um, that preceded the commencement of this particular litigation. Um, and it was you know, commenced around the same time as the Human Rights Law Centre's um, litigation. And there was discussion about bringing you know, multiple cases at the same time. There was um, a nationwide discussion of um, you know, the potential pitfalls of the selection of that particular applicant. Um, you know, and the result was that there were, you know, uh, in the in the first of the several interlocutory hearings, you know, there were fifty or sixty people in in attendance from um, you know different firms, di different legal services all across the country who were invested in that outcome. Um, you know, and when the in the six days between the um, interim judgment being handed down and then reasons for that judgment being published, I received all sorts of phone calls from people all across the country seeking to access the written reasons that didn't exist yet because they'd heard of the outcome and they were looking to. Um, utilize the written reasons to agitate their family members or their friends' cases in, in detention. So um, it, it was concerted, careful, considerate collaboration, um, you know, seeking advice on legal strategy, seeking advice on public strategy, um, connecting with people in the detention network that um, gave meaning to, to that case and meant that it could be run in a way that, you know, I, I wish it had more utility. I wish that we'd situated it um, you know, more in the context of, um, you know, a, a movement to resist people's ongoing detention in, in light of COVID. I wish we'd um, done more of that. But insofar as it was um, to some degree successful, that that was um, the reason for the success, the collaboration. The unity from a from an outsider's perspective, the unity of the sector in such a difficult environment where everyone was under a lot of personal strain and things were moving all over the place was like really, really amazing to to watch. And I know that's something that all four of you personally, that collaborative approach is something that all four of you really epitomize. And um, it's it, it's an inspiration to me. But I wanted to ask you, Scott, if you wanted to to add anything here because um, facilitating collaborations across the sector is part of a role that H, the Human Rights Law Centre very actively plays now and that you engage with, with personally. What does it take to, we've, we've heard from San Marty about how effective good collaboration across the sector can be. I wondered if you wanted to reflect on what it takes to make that happen. Yeah, it was really wonderful to hear somebody reflect on that case. And I think that's right, um, coordination across the legal profession and the refugee sector was such a key element of it. I think there are really two points to it. One is that refugees who are our clients are at a strategic deficit in that their representatives are, they're, they're separated. They don't have a single brain. They don't have a single record of what's happened in the past and what the law is, of how strategy was pursued in previous cases. Um, and it's our job, I think, as a profession to do what we can to make up for that deficit in the interests of our clients. Um, that's not always easy. It means, um, it means uh, sharing knowledge and strategy. Um, it means using um, networks to make the most of our um, capacity and expertise across the profession and get that to as many people as possible. Um, but I also think there's a, a really important point about coordination in another way that was shown in the um, medical transfer cases involving people in offshore detention. Ideally, you want a single case that's just going to crack the system and do all the work for you. But we haven't seen that in relation to offshore detention. Instead, it's been um, really individualised legal action, looking at individual situations, their vulnerabilities, um, the terrible um, impacts that that experience of offshore detention has had on their health, physical and ment mental. Um, and uh, others on the panel have been intimately involved in this as well as many people in the audience, um, there was an incredible mobilization throughout 2017 and 2018 to really get all hands on deck when it comes to making the most out of um, the, the window that that, that uh, 
legal um, strategy opened up. Um, it was the National Justice Project that pioneered the, the, the legal arguments and it was expanded through incredible work from a whole lot of organisations as well as medical professionals, um, a whole host of law firms. We had teams of lawyers working around the clock, um, filing cases late on Saturday nights, getting judgments early on Sunday mornings. Um, but the real limitation to all of this is that it's not a, it's not a complete solution to any of those clients' problems. It was an excellent example of um, the legal profession and its friends um, mobilizing to achieve what could be achieved through legal action. Um, but we also have to um, be clear-eyed about the fact that it's only a partial um, resolution to the problems that those people face. And in answer to the question from the audience earlier, um, we really hope that um, offshore detention, that particularly harmful provision of Australian migration law, isn't something that we are continuing to deal with into the middle and long term. Um, but unfortunately, I don't see um, the resolution to that coming through litigation, I see it coming through um, public opinion, politics and policy change. I can see you nodding a lot, Matthew, and I haven't come to you yet on this, so I wondered if you had anything you wanted to, to add on what it takes to just make a case really, really work as a, I suppose I mean as an exercise of good litigation, like a, 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 a good litigation, irrespective of what the outcome ends up being. Um, I, I mean, I am enthusiastically nodding because I don't know that I could put it much better than um, somebody and, and particularly Scott's point um, uh, just a moment ago. I think the, the thing that one has to bear keenly in mind is who's on the other side. And the other side, of course, is the minister. And it really goes to Scott's point, which I think is right on, which is the minister, I mean, quite literally has one brain, but the, the strategy can be a united strategy with a global approach. And for those of us working on the side of the applicants, we don't have a single brain to refer to and we have to do a lot of talking to coordinate and get an overall strategy. And that's why efforts like the one Sam Marty's spoken about, efforts like the Medivac um, effort, which was a true national effort, um, are the way that we're able to um, affect change through strategic litigation. So that um, uh, disadvantage, I think, is is something worth noting. But I, I do want to put a slightly positive spin on it as well. And that is, I think, we're at a considerable advantage as a sector and in running strategic litigation because we can move a lot quicker than the minister can. And actually, from a strategic point of view, one of the things that I thought was brilliant about the way the Medivac litigation happened, and I can, I'll give another example of it in a moment, was that it all happened very quickly. And we, the people acting for the applicants, had control over the timing. So we could bring the proceeding as soon as it was ready to go. And the minister had to scramble and get himself organised to, to respond to it. And the fact that we had that upper hand, I think, really helped in circumstances where I think we're sort of like the little Greenpeace minnow going around the huge whaling ship that has real difficulty changing course. Um, and we need to sort of utilise that advantage um, as much as possible. The other example which comes to mind where I have felt the same thing was in the um, Malaysia Declaration case, Plaintiff M70, that I was involved in, where, again, we were able to outmanoeuvre the minister because it all happened so quickly and all we had to do was coordinate a small team of lawyers as compared with an entire bureaucracy. So there's a downside and there's an upside. Um, and, again, I agree with what Scott said in particular, but being clear-eyed about that and making use of those advantages and being aware of the disadvantages advantages I think is um, is greatly beneficial. That was a really pithy way of putting something that um, is a theme that's come up throughout this session about the I know the range of advantages and disadvantages that there are on the part of the the government and the minister and, and the sector as well as the different levels on which you can think about refugee litigation um, the individual level as well as the um, the systemic or collective level. And it seems to me that it's so 
difficult to balance these things in order to secure a good outcome on on every level and that sometimes they're they're in conflict with each other or sometimes you don't know whether a win in one area is going to lead to a, a greater harm in another area and Matthew earlier you mentioned that in litigation can involve a win for the individual that leads to a, um, a, a, a detriment systemically speaking but um, it it can go the other way as well, where you can have a case that makes a point that is, is good in general, but doesn't actually lead to a good outcome for, for the client. And so I wanted to jump here to the top question that we've got um, coming through our Q&A from, from Natasha Blucher. She asks, how do the sweeping powers of the minister, often not challengeable in litigation, impact on the decisions made by lawyers in when or how to pursue particular matters? For example, when there is a risk that a client may individually experience retaliatory harm inflicted with the discretionary power of the minister, how do lawyers balance the individual client's interest with the public need for strategic litigation in a particular area? Now, I, I know that all of you could um, could have a lot to say about this, but I wanted to go first to Arif because you work in an area where um, it seems to me that and this is true across refugee litigation, but particularly with people that go through the fast track process that are seeking judicial review, um, the litigation options are quite narrow. It's difficult this, and the stakes are quite high, like clients, um, don't have it yet secured protection. They've potentially got a lot to lose. There are a lot of avenues. There's, there's a lot of factors that they might consider and litigation very well might not be the best option for them. And I was wondering how in your practice you balance this idea of determining whether litigation is actually likely to lead to a good outcome for your client or whether it might hurt them. Yeah, so I think it's a good point that you raise um, because at the moment, we are dealing um, with a system that is essentially um, working against people in many ways. Um, so even if you do end up with a successful outcome at the Federal Circuit Court level in terms of a remittal to the IAA, because of the way it's set up, the person could still end up in the same position three years later. So. Um, in, in, in those situations, um, you have to make some uh, decisions around the underlying merit of cases in, in our um, uh, processes at RACS. Uh, the question would be whether if you were successful at the FCC and the matter was remitted to the IAA um, with representation, would there be a different outcome? I think um, those are the considerations. But again, to go back to what Scott and Samadhi said, I think um, the issues that we're all facing at the moment, especially in the fast track system, it is a creature of politics. Um, and at the moment, um, the, the, you know, every single person who arrived in Australia in 2010 or 2012, they've been here for more than eight years but they could still be going through the refugee determination process. And individual cases to the Federal Circuit Court on judicial review on narrow points will not change that for anybody. So people will still be, uh, at the end of the day, even if they have the best outcome in this process for people seeking protection who are uh, UMAs, unauthorized maritime arrival, they could still, after 10 years, be going through the same system. So I think, um, as Matthew said, you know, litigation is great in terms of um, accounting, um, holding government accountable in the individual cases in our matters, and also documenting the, 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 the issues that um, our clients and this cohort is going through to inform public advocacy on, on this point. Uh, because uh, at this stage, um, it's unlikely that uh, there'll be a case that undermines the whole TPV chev process, uh, but what we know about this cohort and the, the things that they've gone through over the last 10 years, the fact that they're here after 10 years and still can't restart their lives can, um, it can be a part of a broader public advocacy um, um, campaign to try to change this issue. That brings us quite nicely to two other questions from the Q&A that I think 
kind of run together a little bit. So um, Isabel McGarrity's asked um, whether the panel could comment on policy areas in the refugee space where strategies other than litigation are preferable and why, um, or conversely, where litigation is a better option than advocacy or appealing to public sentiment. And Tristan Harley has asked um, whether, um, in light of the fact that strategic litigation um, serves the dual purpose of addressing specific grievances for individual clients and shifting policy and sentiment more broadly, is there a moral obligation for litigators to consult with um, people who might be affected more broadly by, by policy shifts before making the decision about whether to litigate? So I suppose to put all of that into, um, into a nutshell, um, when is it better to litigate and when is it better to do something else? And is there an obligation morally to consult with people who are affected more broadly um, beyond the, the specifics of the case at hand? And I'd like to invite anybody to weigh in on that. Um, I, I might have a go only because I have a, um, a fairly strong view on these questions. I, I entirely understand where those questions um, come from and I could see the importance of them um, if one takes a global perspective, um, which, which, you know, is, is, a, <laughs> is a good perspective to take. But the reason I jump in is because I think actually the answer um, from a lawyer's point of view, is to be very hard-nosed about it um, and to do as you are instructed. So uh, I understand the moral complexity, and I think it was Natasha's question that raised it as well. When do you think about ministers' discretionary powers? The answer is you don't if your client tells you not to. Um, and as to wider consultation, again, I understand why the question's asked, but the answer is there is no wider consultation. If there is a, a client who you are in a legal relationship with and you have obligations to, and the client says, I want you to run this case, I want you to get me out of detention, for example, pretty good reason to run a case, I want you to get me out of detention, you might personally think, oh, well, this is interesting in the biggest scheme of things and this might raise this question, that question. But you don't actually have an option at that point. If they're your instructions, if you've got a proper basis to do so, you bring the litigation and you pursue it as hard as you can. Um, so I don't want to be heard to be dismissing the question in any way, but it, I, I do think that sort of has to be a hard-nosed um, reality about it, which is a much more individualised um, focus than a systemic or strategic focus because in 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 practicality pragmatically that is what we are doing uh, day to day and that that's where our day to day focus is. Does um, anybody? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry <laughs> I might um, um I might have a crack as well. Um, maybe I, I can roll up all of the que all of the questions and then proffer one answer and then you can you know pick over it. Um, to see, to see what's good. Look, um, as to Natasha's question, I, I think that that's all, that's all really interesting. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't mean to be Pollyanna-ish. Our clients are pretty robust. You know, folks are gotten on a boat and relocated their entire lives to uh, another place. Um, you, you've got to preempt the worst conceivable um, response from the department, for instance, in our COVID related litigation. Uh, a, a week before the matter was ultimately decided, there was um, mass transfers to Christmas Island. Um, it was put to the it was put to our client that he may end end up there. Christmas Island detention is used for punitive purposes. Um, movement within a deten detention network is not susceptible to easy challenge. It's used for punitive purposes all the time. At the very least, that's going to happen. We've seen that, of course, with the Billowella family. Um, our clients can instruct us. Our clients instruct us to take. Um, to, that they will take risks. Um, our clients have often taken risks with their with their very lives. Um, they, we, we we do as we're told, um, and and people are capable of accepting cert, certain risks because um, we're led by them. Um, I, I just wanted to answer maybe the other um, question by like not answering it. Um, you know, what is where, when do you what's the ideal case for litigation, and you know where where do you pursue broader strategies? Um, let me maybe not answer that, but um, offer a kind of global proposition. My view is, or, or my desire is, my hope is that over the coming 
you know, starting immediately, that we're going to throw as a legal sector, as a community, um, absolutely everything behind attacking the institution of mandatory immigration detention in, in this country. Um, and by that, I don't mean that we're all going to sit in a darkened room and think about the next client who's going to bring down Alcatim and, and Goodwin. Um, we, you know, that may not necessarily be the, the scope of the challenge. But what I mean to say is um, beginning to advance both litigation strategies and public strategies um, that highlight the fact, number one, that mandatory immigration detention is an institution that's only existed since 1992. It's not a fact of nature. It's not commensurate with um, detention itself. Not, not all countries practice mandatory immigration detention. And to recognise that mandatory immigration detention is in itself inescapably a form of um, in, in human harm. Um, it's, it's appalling and, and egregious. Um, so whatever, um, you know, inroads we can make um, into this, whatever, and of course the COVID-19 con um, context, if ever there was a context to make the case that prolonged det detention in itself is a form of harm, um, now, now is now is the time that's ripe for making for making that point. Um, and you know there are some extraordinary legal developments that have happened o over the past year. So I um, thoroughly recommend you know if, if people are interested reading the case of AJL Twenty. It's an exceptional case um, in which the court examines you know agonisingly um, what precisely what precisely as a matter of Australian law and as a matter of the Australian constitution constrains the detention power, if anything, um, what are the purposive and temporal limits of that power and when will they be infracted? Um, so ca cases like this and the application of cases like this to, for instance, situations, fact situations that we're gonna see um, you know, transpiring because of COVID. So if there are purposive and temporal limitations to um, the period that people are, are detained, what is the purpose of um, the detention of people who cannot realistically be removed to their home country because of COVID? Indeed, whose home countries have issued a directive, which is helpfully collected um, in the UK case in Detention Action and, and Secretary. A, a list of countries across the world have, have um, issued announcements that they will not receive forced returnees um, or forced returns of their own nationals for the foreseeable future because of COVID. What then is the purpose of the detention of, of these people? And this is... We, we need to, through every conceivable avenue that is available to us, continue to attack the institution of detention and the way that it's practiced in this country because it is um, ever expanding. Um, immigration detention being mandatory is the reason that it is also accepted to be indefinite. Immigration detention being in mand mandatory and that being an internalized fact of political and legal life in Australia means that it can be offshored, means that it can be practiced in a bunch of different ways that are not internationally recognized. So I think that by way of litigation, um, by way of public dialogue, by way of community organising, this needs to um, be our object. Um, and now is the time for us to pursue that object. Great. We're rapidly approaching the end of what's been, from, from my perspective, a fascinating hour. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to pose a double-barrelled question to, to each of you. Um, so looking forward over, say, the next five years in Australia, what do you see as being the areas to watch in refugee litigation? And what besides litigation do we need to see more of in order to see better protection outcomes for refugees seeking protection here? So I'll start with you, Scott. Well, I think um, efforts at bringing legal action are going to continue to map on to grievances and to government action. Um, one area of law that I think we've really seen expand a lot in the last 10 years has been bringing tort, tort-based arguments to bear in refugee cases. I mentioned medical transfers from offshore detention, which are an excellent example, but there are many others. The um, Manus Island class action, there's another class action involving people in immigration detention in Australia. Um, uh, the, the case that Sam Marty mentioned, AJL 20, was also um, a, a case that used false imprisonment as, as its centrepiece. Tort is um, a, uh, a, a, an ancient um, area of law that is difficult to legislate away. Um, there are certainly efforts um, that have been made to make it as difficult as possible. Um, and uh, I would also say that it's it's something that only, unfortunately, is only responsive to some of the most egregious situations. Um, but I think we're going to continue to see that um, utilised by refugee lawyers. And the other thing I'd say is um, looking for 
I, I think people will continue to lean into some of the obligations that the Commonwealth has in, in the Migration Act. Um, there are so many examples of people, refugees and others, who've been sitting in detention despite the fact that they have visa applications ongoing. One of the few obligations that the minister has in that scenario is to actually make a decision on the visa application. And there are some ridiculous periods of time elapsing, resulting in years and years of detention, more than is required to resolve it. Um, so there have been some, um, it's high stakes, but there have been some good outcomes um, in people um, uh, calling upon those decisions to be made. And I think that necessity will require that uh, we'll see more of it. Arif? I think uh, for me, I'll just keep it short, but I, f I feel like looking into the next five years, I think we can do more to work with impacted communities in strategic mitigation. I think I take um, Matthew's point that you take instruction from specific clients and they say, you, you go ahead, you go ahead. But I feel like at the time when um, in this social movement, yeah, social justice movement, when refugees and people seeking asylum are continually dispowered, I think there's a role to be played by lawyers and the movement as a whole, whether it's advocates, public advocacy, that we also work with those impacted communities to empower them also in, in the work that we do. And it's been done in the past by the, uh, the programs and work that Matt has been involved before and Scott is doing right now and John Marty. So I would like to see more of that. Sanmari? Um, uh, I think I may have rambled out my response. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but look, uh, I'm, I might add to that. Um, I, I, um, and ma maybe let me address again the, the question that was asked. Um, look, not all exercises of, and, you know, we've gotten used to thinking that exercise of, uh, of personal power by the minister is, is completely inoculated against judicial review. It's simply not. Um, there are some, you know, ex exceptional cases um, handed down recently, you know, where the, the court has entered upon precisely what it is that the minister is doing, you know, what is the evidential basis for that, you know, he's exercising his personal powers on, on what basis, you know, the um, decision of um, Justice Bromberg in hands is an exceptional example, um, the decision of the federal court in Splendido is an exceptional example, you know, just because the minister um, exercises the character power saying that there is a risk um, is that the end of the story? Is, is risky is what the minister says it is. Um, Scott's given an exceptional example, you know, which again is um, sort of a, a subspecies of this propensity that we see as, as lawyers for um, immigration detention to be used for in everything but name punitive purposes. Um, you know, people are being detained. We, we acted for a fellow who was detained for, you know, 11 years pending the resolution of his protection visa application. Why? Um, you know, this man was from Sri Lanka um, through various complexities since at least 2016, he had been conclusively found to be owed protection obligations. Um, commencing litigation, you know, seeking mandamus, you know, seeking to compel a decision on that application um, has been extremely fruitful, not just for us, but for other lawyers, keeping in mind that the framework of authority concerning that remedy um, indicates that where prima facie there is a delay in exercising the power under the Migration Act to decide an application, it, the onus will be reversed um, onto the minister to justify that delay. Um, and, you know, you've got to be aware of risks, but usually issuing litigation um, leads to the minister freaking out and completing the exercise. So, you know, th these are fruitful areas, but let, let's not just... Um, the, the, picture is, the picture is not hopeless. Um, mm -hmm. The powers under the Migration Act are not just what the minister says they are. And Matthew, final word, your areas to watch in the next five years. Um, I, I want to pick up on what Scott said and expand on it and, and say Martin expand on it slightly. Scott said focus on tort and I think he's right about that, but I'd expand it slightly to say I think the hot area for the next five years is the common law. Now, the reason I draw that distinction is because the common law includes the ancient writ of habeas corpus and my own view, if you're asking for a prediction, is that I think we're on the cusp of the rise and rise of habeas corpus being used in migration litigation. It has the very substantial benefit of two things. Firstly, for the reason Scott said, it's not immune from legislative reform, but close. It's been around for 800 years and hasn't been touched. Um, but the second thing, and I think this is absolutely crucial, is that 
it, when you seek a writ of habeas corpus, you come to the court, as everyone knows, and say, I'm detained. And once you've proven that, the evidential burden falls on the detaining officer to explain why your detention is lawful. And at that point, you, in a sense, can sit back a little bit and have the minister um, hopefully squirm uh, trying to explain why it is that the detention continues to be lawful. Um, AJL 20 that San Marti mentioned is the start of that uh, process linking back to the High Court's decision in Plaintiff S4 um, that many will be familiar with. Can I also um, just say that I think that landscape is going to be um, substantially um, shaped by a forthcoming decision of the full court of the federal court. Uh, for those interested, the case is um, the case of Edward McHugh, where due judgment in it any day, but it asks many of the fundamental questions about habeas corpus in a um, immigration detention context. My message would be watch this space and for those involved, exploit it as much as you can. We surely will do. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of our panellists for being part of um, such a great session from my perspective and thank all of you for, for joining us today. Um, please do stick around for our breakout session, which I'm sorry, we ran a couple of minutes over in, in this one, should start in a couple of minutes. There's a link in the chat um, and you can also access it from the lobby on the Caldor Centre conference page. So hope to see some of you there and thank you for joining us.